uh, this is Professor Jeff Wilkerson at Luther College with an introduction to exercise 15, determining the mass of the moon from uh, the, the lab book published by Kendall Hunt, uh, Astronomers as Observers and Experimenters, uh, the Astronomy Lab Book. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what we're trying to get out of this particular laboratory activity, some of the ideas to keep in mind as you go through it, and really, um, so what's, what, there's, a, there's a wonderful number of things for us to think about with this activity. This activity can help us think about uh, lots of ideas in astronomy a, a little more broadly. It is, it's, what we have there is some telemeter data from a satellite in orbit around the moon. And so we have one, one, two, two bodies in orbit around the center of mass of the system, but one of the bodies is so small that you can take the center of the heavier body to be the center of mass of the system and just ignore the mass of the lighter object. We can apply Newton's uh, form of Kepler's third law to, to determine the mass of the thing being orbited there, the mass of the moon, if we neglect the mass of the smaller object from the semi-major axis of the orbit and the period of the orbit. And so this is, you know, what is a great practice for this technique. It's one of these exercises where, you know, it's good to know the mass of the moon. This is a, a, one of the best ways for us to determine the mass of the moon is to put something in orbit around it and do this work. Um, and yet um, it's got much bigger uh, importance as well to say, that when, when we're thinking about masses of stars, for example, this is the way we determine masses of stars most directly is to find stars in binary orbits, and so in binary systems, and measure the periods of the orbit from the semi-major axes uh, of orbit, and boom, we've got the masses of stars. Uh, you know, it's a little more complicated there because if you think about the tilt angle of the orbit relative to the sky, uh, you get a, project, a projected ellipse, not an actual ellipse of orbit. You have to take that into account. You've got to do a lot of work to make that happen, but we can do that. And, you know, really interesting, fun story um, about Herschel, William Herschel, who was trying to look for parallax in the stars and was measuring uh, fainter stars next to brighter stars. Really good idea to say, well, if you see a faint star really close to a bright star, uh, it must be two stars that are just a chance alignment. The faint star is much further away. It turns out not to be the case. It turns out to be most of the stars that he looked at were actually binary systems, and some stars are just intrinsically much less luminous. They have less mass. We know that now. We have a mass-luminosity relationship because we've been able to do this work and determine the masses of stars and measure, oh, uh, the, you know, the luminosity of a star depends on the mass to the, the 3.5 power or something like that to say on the main sequence to say that there's a huge range of luminosities. But, but Herschel was disgusted, right? Herschel was trying to measure trigonometric parallax. He was trying to see the, the brighter star jump back and forth relative to the fainter star, and he couldn't see it because they were in orbit around each other. But those stars that he discovered uh, uh, over 200 years ago, those stars that he discovered are now the stars that are, are just now completing their orbits sometime, and we're able to do this work and really get good mass measurements that way. So they're a, a treasure trove of information for us by, by applying the ideas in this exercise. So this is a great exercise uh, for that reason. Um, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to plot the orbit of this satellite around the moon from the data that we give you, from the data that was telemetered back. And you can use the graph paper that is part of the exercise. So you got a graph paper that's that looks like this, that's in there. You can use your own graph paper. You can, of course, do this plotting on a computer. And so that would be just fine is to, uh, to plot this on the computer and do all of this work on the computer. Uh, when I would do this work with students, we often uh, can't count on having enough computer resources. So we still do a lot of this work by hand, um, but it, it's good either way. And, and one of the things that you want to do is you want to try to determine if this is consistent with an ellipse and with a, uh, Newton uh, Kepler's laws uh, of, of, of orbital motion, of this elliptical orbital motion. And so one of the things I like to do is I like to say, well, if Kepler's right, then the moon, uh, the center of the moon, is going to be at zero, zero in our coordinate system. That's going to be one of the foci, okay? And so we're measuring everything in lunar radii. Let's take a step back there and talk about this. So we're measuring the position of the 
uh, satellite relative to the center of the moon in a unit of measure that is the radius of the moon. So that's the graph paper we have set up in lunar radii right there. And you're going to want to convert that if you, once you try to do this, this measurement to get the mass of the moon out of here. Uh, you're going to need to convert that to kilometers or meters or something like that. And, we, and the exercise walks you through doing that. But to say we're measuring this, we're making a scale model. Think of this graph that you're building here as a scale model of the actual orbit. Okay, we can make that any scale we want, right? Just like a scale model train or, or whatever people use scale models for. Now, you can have very small scale models or larger scale models or larger. And we could have done that here. So this is a particular scale where one radius of the moon is equal to one box on this, this graph paper. So that's one radius of the moon. That sets the scale. It says this many millimeters in scale model space is equal to this many kilometers in real physical space. And so uh, it, you can convert back and forth from your scale model. So one of the things you want to ask yourself as you go through this is when we're trying to figure out the properties of this orbit, some things we can do in the scale model system, and some things we need to convert to the actual physical orbit. If you want to know what the semi-major axis of orbit is, you don't care what it is on your scale model, because you, you just set the scale whatever you want it. You care what it is in real physical space. How far away from the center of the moon is that satellite at any given time? So you have to do that in real physical orbit space, not in scale uh, model space. So that's one of the things uh, that you think about. But other things, like trying to determine, one of the things we'll do is, is try to determine if this is consistent with being an ellipse. And, and one of the ways we like to do that is we'll say, well, okay, let's, let's figure out some properties here. Okay? If we want to figure out the semi-major axis or the major axis of this, the major axis is going to go through that, that focus point, and it's going to be the longest line. You can draw through it, right? That's not the major axis. That's not the major axis. The major axis is going to be the longest line that goes through that focus point. And so you keep twiddling this around until you find that longest line and you've got your major axis. The minor axis is going to be the shortest line that goes to the midpoint of the major axis, right? That's not the minor axis. The minor axis is going to have to be perpendicular and go right through the midpoint. The other focus point is going to be the same distance in on this end as this focus point was on this end. And we start to get some some properties of, uh, of the ellipse that's going on. If we want to think about, does the, is this consistent with being an ellipse? That's the first question we ask. This is a great, another great idea that comes up in this exercise is that we've, we've emphasized in this book this, this Popperian model of the process of science where you have this infinite loop and you don't ever prove anything right. You can only show that things are not right. Your model needs to be improved. You can falsify models but you can't uh, prove that a model is actually correct. We can't prove that this is an elliptical orbit. We can just show that it's consistent with being elliptical, an elliptical orbit within the precision of what we're able to do. And one of the ways we do that is we know that the property of an ellipse is such that if we take a, and draw a line from one focus to any point on the ellipse back to the other focus, that distance, the distance there plus the distance there, adds up to be the same, no matter what point to the ellipse we went to. So you want to ask, how, you know, how many times should you do that in order to satisfy yourself that, 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 that this is an ellipse, or consistent with an ellipse? That this is, you know, there's some uncertainty in just being able to measure this in the precision of, of your, your ruler and in the, the, the points, the, the ellipse that you've drawn on here and so on. Uh, there's some limit to the precision that you can get. And maybe two is enough. Maybe you want to do three or four and measure them and see what the scatter is. And, and just uh, you have to decide for yourself. That's, what, that's another theme of this work that we're doing in this book is the astronomer has to make decisions about whether this is good enough. And there are good mathematical tools to do it if you want to go through it, but go, go through that. But it's also good just to look at it. But then you ask yourself, suppose I'm going to do this twice. Suppose I'm going to look at this two different times and, and do this. Do I want to draw one that looks like this? That symmetry suggests that we might be able to get um, two values that are close, even if this wasn't really an ellipse. I wouldn't do draw two highly symmetric paths. I would draw a path that looks like that, where those aren't symmetrical, or one that's way up here and like that, where these different paths look, they look very different from one another. And draw a few of those that are very, very different. And if that length plus that length 
is re it's, it's within your uncertainty of that length plus that length and that length plus that length, then I think you're in pretty good shape. There plus that, that plus that, that plus that, okay? And the same thing with the area. So you want to see if Kepler's second law is consistent, uh, if this is consistent with, with Kepler's second law being valid, and you want to pick a, out two points on the, uh, on the, the, a couple of points on the orbit that are separated by 15 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 minutes, and you have 15 or 30 or 45 minutes. Again, if I'm trying to find out the areas of, a, of an ellipse, and I, I, I want to say a line connecting the focus to the, the satellite swept out that much area, if I, I think the, the best test is to probably look at something that's very different shape like that, right, over here. But then go ahead and do one more over there, and you're doing a really good job of verifying Kepler's second law seems to be valid for this system. So that's, you know, one of the things you want to do is to say you're just testing to see if this is consistent with the, the Kepler's laws being valid, this being an elliptical orbit. That's one of Kepler's laws with the center of the moon at one focus. So you're building this up and saying you're building this scale model and using this scale model, you're bu building up an argument to say this is, this orbit seems to be consistent uh, with, with Kepler's laws. Uh, generalized using the Newtonian form here, and then we can find the mass. We can pull the mass out of here, and hopefully the exercise does a pretty good job of walking you through how you can pull that, uh, that mass out of there, and you can see the conversions that you need to make, and so on, uh, to get the, the mass of the moon out of there. In some, in some ways, this is a relatively simple exercise. Uh, you, you, you go, it's, it's a straightforward look at, at ma making a graph of an orbit, a scale model of an orbit, and, and finding the mass of the moon. In other ways, as we've already talked about, there's a lot of hidden ideas in there. You need to think about uncertainties. You need to think about um, what you're not proving anything is true. You're just showing that something's consistent with something else. You're not able to falsify it. Or maybe you are able to falsify it. Um, things probably aren't perfect ellipses. Right? Uh, uh, you've got other objects pulling on, on this thing, and so maybe it's not a perfect ellipse. And so you, you're, you're asking that kind of question all the way through there, and what can you do with the data you have and the system you have? And this, this idea of applying the Newtonian form of Kepler's third law is so powerful uh, to, to so many different systems, finding the mass of Jupiter, uh, finding the mass uh, of Neptune, and so on, that you, you really, um, this is, the, this is just a great, great exercise for getting a lot of ideas built into there. So this is what you want to do. You want to go out and make this graph and start to test things and say, well, you know, uh, what can I do in graph space? The lengths of these lines, I don't have to convert those to real physical space, right? Because the lengths of those lines, if I convert them to real physical space and then I'm add them up just to say if this plus this is equal to this plus this, um, if it's true in graph space, it's true in real physical space. Same for the areas and stuff like that. But if you want to know the actual size of the orbit, you want to get the actual mass of the moon, you better, um, you better be converting to real physical space. So uh, I hope you enjoy doing this exercise. I enjoy it. Uh, we, this is one of them we do most years in class when I'm teaching the class uh, that I think it, because of so many of these ideas that are underneath there, I think it's really an important, valuable one for us to do. Good luck with it, and take care, everybody.